Hi everyone, I'm Stephen and welcome to Audio Nautica. Today on the bench we've got this Crown CE1000 amplifier. This is from about the year 2000 or so. This is a relatively modern amplifier. Now it's been reported to me that when this was turned on um, it kind of went bang and there was a flash. So uh, what I've done already is um, I gave it an inspection and I found that there was metal swarf floating around inside which is never very good. So I tipped out the metal swarf. I tested it with uh, my Dimbold tester um, which will still indicate to me whether there's a dead short or not inside the unit and there wasn't. Um, so that's good. But um, turning it on the um, the relays don't kick in to enable the output and just having a look around it I can just see that there does look to be a fair bit of um, well certainly a fair bit of dirt I'm just going in to have a look it's not especially clean but also corrosion um, there is some corrosion on the board it's not super bad but um, the problem with this amplifier is it's not especially serviceable in that the bottom panel does not come off, it's part of the, the chassis. So basically to work on it you've got to pull the circuit board out which is a real nuisance. Um, Crown's solution to that is to provide a harness kit which allows you to, to, to operate the board, run the board with it hanging out of the unit. Now obviously I don't have the harness kit. Um, but at least I was able to find the service manuals for this thing pretty easily on the internet. So what I'm going to do before I go any further with this thing, I want to have a look at more closely at the board. I want to give it a clean up. I can't do that while it's in here. I want to look at the underside of the board. This is a, it's got surface mount technology on it. So I want to be sure that that's right. There are also a few um, suggestions in the service manual of various um, flyback diodes and things to check. So I'll do that and that'll be easier to do while it's out. So that's what I'm going to do now is pull this board out. Okay, so the service manual does give instructions on how to get this board out, which is quite convenient. So I'm just going to follow this, those instructions and I'm going to film all of this because I might need it to get it all back together. So take the top cover off. I've already done that. Remove the red and blue wires from the rectifier block that's screwed to the bottom of the chassis near the power supply capacitors. Red wire is top left, blue wire is bottom right. Disconnect the inline fast on that connects the circuit board to the transformer. Um. Okay, that'll be this thing here. have to cut this cable tie off as well. So that one goes to there. Okay, I think that's the only one at this stage. Incidentally, this thing looks like it had been full of um, animals as well, like wasps' nests and things. Um, so now it says remove this disconnector here. So that's that 
four pin connector disconnected. Disconnects the small white wire that connects the circuit board to the rectifier block. Um, I'm assuming that's this one here. Okay, how do I do that? Oh, okay, I see. So there's actually a little um, spade terminal on the actual rectifier itself. Because it looks like it's soldered onto the board. Yep, there we go. So that one comes off. I'm going to have to cut this cable tie as well, just to get this freed up. Okay. Remove the four screws that hold the input assembly to the chassis. Okay, that'll be this guy here. I might just have to turn it around. And it says, unplug the input assembly from the ribbon cable. So, it's holding this on. It's got a little latch. Just look at how that works. Oh, okay, I see. Pull the latch that way. Yeah, had to pull the latch that way to unlatch it. Find the screw that fell on the floor. Fish out the other screw that's stuck in there. There we go, four screws. I might just pot them back in the Sometimes it's hard to remember where screws come from, so I'll just pot them back in there. And then I know where they go because that's just going to be out of the way over there. Okay. Unplug. I'll remove the four screws that hold the output jacks to the back panel. Okay, we can do that. Uh, they look like they are torques. See if they're T15s. They are T15s. I think there's a few little divergences actually in the manual because 
it's not actually talking about these screws. In the manual, um, I don't think the variation in the manual actually has these connectors. It just is talking about these. So it actually wants me to remove these four screws here. Um, so I'll take those ones out now. And we'll work out what to do with the other ones in a tick. Yeah, quite a bit of dirt and a bit of rust on the chassis, which is a bit of a bit of a shame, but hopefully the electronics is not too bad. So those are free. I think I will take these out as well. Oops, that's a T15. sure whether that achieves very much but anyway unplug the fan from the circuit board that's gonna be nice and easy done remove the eight screws that hold the circuit board down to the chassis Okay, we can do that. Should hopefully be all the ones for the front. And then we've got some down here. One there. Okay, and then there's one hiding. Just down there. 
right on the end of the board next to the main caps. Okay. All right, that's all of the screws out. Now, there's this extra set of output connectors that are not in the manual, and I'm gonna to have to disconnect them. They look like they're just connected straight to these relays. So this is the back panel here. So we've got the red one goes to the left-hand relay, noting that one of the spades didn't have anything in it, so we know where it's connected to. That orange one there, then this is the ground. So this should come out now. There we go. Okay, so remove the game put knobs. I've already removed those. So this should all, all be free now, and it is. Now the tricky part will be getting it out because as the manual says, the circuit board will now lift out of the chassis, but be careful, it is a tight fit. Okay, so it does have to come forward because we've got these, these connectors poking through the panel. I can see we're clearing that side. Oh, okay, here we go. Oh, yeah, there. oh goodness gracious me, look at that. That's what I'm looking at. There was a colony of mud wasps inside of this thing, which is not good. And um, they're called mud wasps because they bring mud. They make their nest nests out of mud. So there's a fair bit of dirt and whatnot floating around in this thing. But with the circuit board out, there's now virtually nothing inside this unit. All that is in it is the power transformer, the on switch, the circuit breaker, and the um, IEC connector, and the bridge rectifier, and that is it. I do want to have a closer look at what's going on with the bridge rectifier because there's a capacitor, a film capacitor has been bodged in there and I really do not like the look of that at all. That looks seriously dodgy. Certainly not factory. Um, so I don't like the look of that. But anyway, we'll leave that alone for now. That's all academic. So I'm just going to get this um, case out of the way for now so that it's off the bench. Oh, it's true, it's still very heavy. Okay. So I, I started using a towel on my workbench because I was scratching up my static mat with all of these great big amplifiers being dragged around on it. So, now that we've got a circuit board, I want to have a bit of static protection for it. Okay. So that actually wasn't too hard to get out. If we have a look at the bottom side to see what's on there. Oh gee, yeah, there is a fair bit. But initially, I mean, there's a little bit of mud from the mud wasps, but this side actually looks pretty clean. Quite a few surface mount components, but um, I mean, I will need to look at it on a magnification. But it, it looks pretty clean on this side, but um, it's this side that I'm a little bit concerned about. Um, you know, you can see just here, for example, 
these are the LEDs, uh, the front panel LEDs, and you know I can see the corrosion on that with the naked eye from 30 centimeters away. So it definitely needs some cleaning up. Look, you know, look at this. Look at this. You know, look at how much dirt I just picked up off there. That's awful. So um, yeah, time to give this a good clean up, and hopefully. Once we've done that, um, it'll be a lot happier. Okay, this is looking a whole lot better than it was now. Um, it's very difficult, of course, to get all of the dirt off, but it looks a whole lot better. Um, I was quite concerned about some of these surface mount devices with sort of like scunge in between the legs and so on. It's not impossible, we might have to do some more rework, but we'll see. Now the service manual has a, a handy sort of static checks um, to do for the most common faults. So it says there's some flyback diodes, and it says to check for a short. And if there's a short, it means an output device or driver transistor in parallel with that diode is shorted, usually not the diode itself. So... D114, 115, 214 and 215. I've already had a little peek to see where they are. And that's them right down there in between the heat sinks. So there's those two there and then there's two more there. So let's see if I can um, get in there without shorting the either leads to other things will be the tricky bit. Or I could do it from underneath, but we'll see. Uh, I think I need to do it from underneath. Um, so it would be quite tricky to do with this in the unit. I mean, it's doable, of course, but um, it's just going to be easier to do it from underneath. Okay, so looking from underneath, it's these guys here. So there's one. No short there. There's another one. And then these ones. I think that's a short, that's just... Looks more like something charging up. Yeah, it is something charging up. Oops. Okay. All right, check driver and pre-driver transistors for shorts or opens. If a fault is found, do an in-circuit static check of all semiconductors on the output modules. Okay, well, I have already had a little peek, actually. And... What I have found... I haven't looked at any schematics yet, by the way, so I'm just not quite sure what everything is, but that's all right. These resistors here are all open. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are meant to be a, a 0 0.4 ohm resistor. All ten of these are dead. Open circuit, you can see the the top of the um, resistor is gone. So um, this is, this corresponds to one quarter of the amplifier or one half of the channel. So it's basically corresponds to everything here. So the, um, 
the book is saying to the manual is saying to check the drivers and the pre-drivers so it's interesting I haven't looked at the schematic yet as I said they're all um, they're all MJ21194s so I'm not sure what that is when it's alive um, two th year 2000 date code so that's how I know this thing's from about the year 2000 but they are all MJ two one one nine fours so they're not um, P and N channel pairs they're all the they're all the same whatever the heck they are so anyway um, but each channel has got like a half and then there's a driver transistor which will be this one and then around the other side there's a driver transistor here. So it's a C5242. And this one, it's the same, a C Toshiba C5242, whatever that is. Um, so this is the quadrant here. This quadrant here, just check it. Yes, it is. This quadrant here is blown. And the fact that all of those resistors are blown suggests to me to start with the driver transistor stage. different see that behaves differently so you're looking those across those two right hand pins I mean I'm not seeing a short but on this one it looks like it's charging up into something whereas this one I'm getting 150 ohms so anyway what I think that I'm inclined to do is just take this transistor out and give it a test on the transistor tester and see what we find. Hmm. It's interesting. I would have thought I'd see some thermal compound or something on this. Yeah. Feels like there's some sort of a goo there, but it's not the normal white stuff. Anyway. So, according to the schematic, this should be an NPN transistor. And it's a 2SC5242. See if there's any battery left in my... Oh, there is some battery left in that. Well, that seems to be okay. Gain 127 reaches an MPM, which it is. So that seems to read okay, but something has caused all of these resistors to fail something fairly catastrophic so ideally we want to try to work out what that was okay what I'm going to do is just pull off one of these um, 
dead resistors, according to the schematics, they're one watt. Um, but I just need to see what size they are because they are dead and they will need to be replaced. Now the trick is that they've been glued down to the board. So um, obviously the bottom side has been soldered first. And so with these larger components, you need to glue them down because otherwise when you solder the top side, they'll be facing down and they'll fall off, which is kind of really bad. So this one does not want to come off. It doesn't matter if I destroy them, but I do want it to come off in one piece. Yep, that works. There we go, gotcha. Yeah, it was definitely the glue that was holding it on. I just wanted to make sure I got that one off at least in one piece because now I can measure it rather than having to fiddle about with the parts list to work out what size it is. The schematic tells me it's one watt and yeah you can see from the pads it's about the right size so it's 0.4 of an ohm, so definitely as an absolute minimum I'm going to need some of those. Okay, so I think I finally found a schematic. Um, the, the service manual's got a gazillion schematics in it, that's the problem for all the different variants of this amplifier. So it was just a bit of a nuisance to find out which one. As you can see the title block's absolutely useless. So I just kind of kept looking until I found one that the designators seem to match um, the area that I'm looking at. So this is showing one part of the output stage. So there's the rest of it up there. But the part that I'm interested in is this part here, because these are the resistors that have blown. So it's these two here, one, two plus these eight down here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sorry, ten of them. So these ten resistors are all blown. This is the transistor that I pulled out and it tested fine with the transistor tester. Um, but I guess the great thing about testing stereo amplifiers is that you can often sort of play one of these is not like the others. Um, and you can look at what's going on in the other channel, presuming that it's working. So the next transistor is this one here, Q220, which drives Q221. So that is on the bottom side of the board. And it's right next to our pre-driver transistor. And what I've noticed is that 
looking across these two pins here I've got 10 ohms so that's actually across this cap capacitor is the same place it's a bit easier to measure 10 ohms which seems pretty suspicious to me so if I then find the equivalent transistor on the other side which is this one here and I can measure across the equivalent capacitor it reads as open so that suggests to me that something might not be right here perhaps with Q220 okay I'm going to take this transistor off just so that I can check it um, because I measured um, collector to emitter I get 11 ohms across there as well which doesn't seem right so it won't be difficult to get this off as long as I turn the soldering iron on Okay. And that actually added solder because there was a bit of solder on the tip, which wasn't that good. It's better. So when I worked in electronics professionally, this is basically the way that we would do things like lift these legs Oops, bent that one a little bit more than I wanted to, but should be okay. Oop, there we go. Let's clean up the pads now. So you can see that component was glued down as well. So you know, I really did actually need to prise it off anyway. You could have sat there with the hot air and it would have done nothing because it's glued down.
All right, who took my prizing stick? I know it's here because I haven't been anywhere. Ah, there it is. Now let's see if we can carefully meter this. My transistor tester is still charging its battery, but yep, 12 ohms. That's collected to emitter. Five ohms, that's base to emitter, I think. Eleven ohms. I don't think that's right. In fact, I could guarantee that's not right because the other one, when I test it in circuit, I don't get anything like that. So we'll test it on the resistor, on the transistor tester anyway once I get a bit of charge into it, but everything so far is indicating that this could be our problem. Okay, so it's on the transistor tester now. Yep. That is not a transistor any longer. It is now a resistor which may well explain why all of those transistors have died, all those resistors have died, those 0.4 ohm resistors. So that's encouraging, we've made some progress. So that was Q220, which according to the schematic is a PZTA 92T1 and just looking at this one yeah I'm not sure who manufactured that um, but yeah that would seem to be our problem so that is really encouraging. What is frustrating is that I've already placed my Farnell order to get those um, 0.4 ohm resistors. So I'm now going to have to place a, another Farnell order to get hold of one of these transistors. But anyway, first thing is to work out just what it is and to work out what I need to order in. Okay guys, so I decided to have a little bit of a look further back while I'm at it. Um, the circuit diagram is kind of weird, it's like there's bits missing or I don't know what that is, but anyway. It looks to me like this transistor Q209 is probably kind of important. So if I find that one... he gone okay there he is there all right so that's Q209 there and what I find is if I do a um, diode check that doesn't seem right and then if I find his buddy on the other channel Q109 which is over here 
I do the same thing around this way. Okay, I get 0.6 of a volt that way. So if I look on this one here, I do not get 0.6 of a volt. So something is different between those two, which again is bad, indicates something further upstream has failed. Okay, so I've had a good poke around and I can't see anything else obvious at this stage. So I'm just going to take this transistor off because I have reason to believe that it's faulty. could be difficult, if not impossible, to get the um, transistor tester under this, but I should be able to do this. seeing low resistance across it which means the problem might be somewhere else okay guys I'm sure that you spotted before I did that I made a bit of a blue and actually pulled the wrong part off uh, ended up pulling this one off which is a diode and it's actually this part here that needed to come off so I needed to put some more electrons into the camera, so while that was happening, I put this guy back on and I pulled this guy off. And sure enough, um, as I expected, that transistor has failed. Um, I've got basically no chance of getting that onto, there it is down there, no chance of getting that onto the transistor tester. But um, yeah, it just measures resistors, so that part has definitely failed. So there are two transistors there that have failed. Um, couldn't find any local stock. Mauser has got stock. But before I go placing an order, um, I do want to do some more poking around just to see whether there are possibly any other failed components. Um, I did have a fairly ex extensive poke around already and um, didn't find anything but I just want to spend a little bit more time doing that um, because I want to have a good level of confidence that I have found everything A before I put power on it um, because otherwise it could just end up blowing everything up that I replace which would be really really annoying I mean I'll get spare um, transistors because they're not that expensive and I need one each but the resistors there's 10 of those and they're not cheap, so um, 
you know, I'm not buying enough of those to be able to replace them again. And it's not the best way to do it anyway, is to, you know, blow things up again and find out that you hadn't found the root cause. So that's what I'll do is just put a little bit more effort um, poking around just to see if there's anything else that I've missed. Oh, and the reason why I pulled the wrong transistor off, it's kind of a bit amusing, really. I mean, basically, the problem is, is that you guys can actually see better than I can because I've got to kind of have the camera um, somewhere where you guys can get a good view because otherwise it's a bit pointless making a video, which means that it's quite difficult for me to get the Maggie lamp um, and the work into an ideal position. So um, basically what happened is I just wasn't I am looking closely enough and there's all these parts that look the same very close to one another. Um, so, and I also wasn't really expecting to get into surface mount technology when I got into this hobby. Um, I used to do a lot of surface mount as an engineer. Um, I don't particularly really want to do it again. Um, through holes a lot easier, but this amplifier came up to be repaired and so here it is with a heap of surface mount. So, um, when I was in the profession, I would have done this under a microscope. Um, most of these components are big enough that I can do it under a Maggie lamp, but I need to be really right on top of it, which I can't do with a camera in the way. So um, it is my intention to pick up a microscope at some point that will have a, a camera fitting as well. So I'll be able to record that and you guys will be able to see what I can see. But uh, right now I don't have that. So unfortunately that's, that's just the way it is. But um, that's basically the reason why why you guys saw it before I did is because you get a better view than I do because um, you guys come first. Hi guys, just want to touch base with where we're at with this Crown CE1000A. So I had planned to do most of the work on camera, but um, it hasn't quite worked out that way for a number of reasons. A bit of backing and forthing. Um, also that I've come down with COVID. Um, so I've just been getting over that the last few days. This is the first day where I feel like I'm starting to really recover. Um, but just out of sort of sheer boredom, I've done a bit of work on this over the last few days. But I've also had to wait for parts to come in and um, also, you know, didn't really want to be coughing and hacking on the camera. So... Um, that's the way it is. But I just wanted to update you with where I'm at because I have made a fair bit of progress. Um, I have placed a Mauser order which I'm expecting to turn up in the next couple of hours. Um, and also the order has turned up from um, Farnell. So those are the 0 0.4 ohm resistors that we identified all of these had failed. So I pulled um, all of the dead ones off. Um, but in the last clip, um, I talked about doing some more poking around because I just wasn't quite sure that I'd found everything. And that was absolutely the case. Um, when I did some DC resistance tests, um, so basically what I found essentially is that there's a short on the output, a short to worth. And it took me a while longer to find it than I would have liked to. Part of that was because of these... Um, the schematics being um, a bit of a pain to read, just the way they've um, scanned, the lines haven't been picked up in the scan process made them difficult to read and a gazillion variations of the schematics as well. But I got to this point here, the um, cathode on, on D209 and found that there was a short to earth there. Um, so I then quickly discovered that that was the output um, so to narrow it down a bit, I took this inductor out, um, which told me that it was on this side. And so then looking down here, I found this um, Triac Q31 um, is one of the few components between the output and earth. Most of them are to the plus or minus high voltage. So um, on a gut feeling, I pulled that one out because those kind of components are prone to failure. So this is it here, and yes indeed, um, it has failed. So I'll just show you that again. Yeah, 0.3 of an ohm across there, and more importantly, when it's out, the, the short across the output is gone. 
So that's really, really encouraging. Um, so we can see here, these are the these are the dead parts that I've pulled out. The triac, those the pre-driver transistor that's Q209. That's the dead 0.4 ohm resistors. There's another 5.6 ohm resistor here. Uh, where is it? Yeah, that's him there. Um, you can probably see the tops being blown off him, so that also needs to be replaced. So I've got all those parts coming from Mauser, so I will replace those. Um, I've refitted the um, driver transistor. Um, it had some kind of like a gel on it. I've never seen it before. I presume it's a thermal compound of some sort, but I just put some of the, the standard white paste on the back of that. Um, so this is where we're at. So, so once these parts arrive from uh, Mauser, I'll stick those in. But I have got these 0.4 ohm resistors have turned up from Farnell, so I think I can start whacking those in now. Okay, I'm just going to do just one of these on camera. Um, but a lot of people get a bit scared of surface mount. Um, I don't think there's any need to be afraid of surface mount. Um, I think certainly as a hobbyist, you can do most of what you'd want to do by hand. Um, I don't have any hot air equipment. Um, yep, there are certainly components that you could not do without um, hot air equipment. But... Um, For this kind of stuff, um, you don't even really need you know, SMD tweezers or anything like that. So for soldering a component like this on, I mean this is a fairly large component um, as far as surface mount goes, but the principle is exactly the same. And it's about being able to see what you're doing. So I just tin one end get the component where it needs to be and then just heat in and just there we go see that see how you got that nice wet look over the end of the pad that's when you know there we go. Beautiful wet look across the end of the pad. Lovely. And um, I am certain that that is well soldered, but just to be sure, I can measure between there and there. And I get a good result. So it's basically doing that nine more times. Okay, so there we are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, point four ohm resistors replaced. Okay, so the order from Mauser has turned up, which is really fantastic because I placed it, I think, on. Tuesday and today is Friday so come from the USA um, that quickly is pretty good um, and DigiKey is the same that kind of time frame so that's fantastic so we'll just get these parts changed over this is the 5.6 ohm resistor, it's got to come off, this will be, again it'll be glued on. There we go.
it's got to get this little resistor out of his packaging. There we go. Right, and that's that guy. Now, might whack on um, Q209, which is the transistor that drives the pre driver. Helps if I open the right package. It's this one. I did get ten of these because they're so cheap. But um, I'll be really annoyed if I end up needing ten. So let's get one of them out of here. Something that I never realized until I started running a factory that makes electronics is that one of the biggest drivers of, of so-called scrap components or lost components um, in a production line is because of these tape leaders. So, I'll try the other end if it doesn't want to come. You have to have this, this, this clear tape um, covers up the component and holds it in there, but you have to have it folded back a certain distance. Oops, there it goes. And um, then there'll be like a nozzle will come in the pick and place machine and it will come down and it will pick up the component. But usually, just the way the geometry of the feeder works, this tape will be peeled back um, for a relatively large component like this, it might be peeled back, say, one or two more um, components. So each one of these holes corresponds to like a, a tooth in a wheel that feeds this along. Um, so at any point that you stop production, there will be there might be two transistors that are just sitting here without the tape to hold them on. So if you um, have to unload the job for whatever reason, well, you can't stick the tape back down. So um, most production line operators, what they'll do is they'll actually tape these components with a bit of masking tape onto the side of the reel. So if you ever wonder why you get a reel back with um, components taped to the side of it, that's why. Um, so basically every time that you change a job over, um, that you, you stop production for whatever reason, that happens. And the smaller the component is, the more of them are exposed when this tape um, is peeled back so that the nozzle can pick them up. So, yeah, that was a frustration that I had as an engineer because I didn't understand the nuances of the production line. But yeah, when I started running the factory, I learnt these kinds of things pretty quickly. So I just want to um, 
meter this part out first just to make sure that it does seem to be um, pinned the same way. Okay, it does seem to be pinned the correct way. So this guy is the smallest part that I'm going to be fitting, I hope. And it has an asymmetrical pin pattern. So, but again, the technique is the same. Basically just um, tack one leg on. Then once it's tacked in place, it won't go anywhere. And you just solder the other legs on. So that's that one on. And then we'll do Q220. Let's go here. Now, for this one, I'll be tacking it on with one of these smaller pads, because if I tacked it on with the big one, it's just such a large amount of solder that if I needed to, to move it or something, it'd be a lot harder to do, so it's better to do it this way. Now that solder joint looks terrible, but it doesn't matter because its purpose is to hold it in place for now. So I'll just get the other ones done. Beautiful. Now I can fix this one much better. Now this one. Hopefully. Okay, and that leaves our troublesome SCR. Okay, so it's a triac actually, not an SCR. Um, and I just double checked the pin out just to make sure that it's the same, and it is. So, pop this guy in. And I have not cleaned the holes out yet, which makes it a bit challenging to get it in. Looks like I've done everything else except for that while I was waiting for the bits to turn up. That's okay. It won't take us long to do that, as long as I can find my flux. Um, so this is a liquid flux that I use. Um, I think it's X11. Uh, let me just check that. X32, multi-core X32 flux. Um, it's the standard stuff, but this is certainly the stuff that you want to use for, 
for this kind of work. Um, you know, you don't want the goos or the, you know, the pastes because they just leave a massive, massive mess. Whereas this stuff cleans up really, really well. So once I discovered this stuff, I've never really used anything else. I mean, the only time when this stuff, as you see it, it burns off really quickly. So the only time that you'd really want, um, like a paste kind of flux would be for something kind of really heavy where you needed the flux to not burn off so quickly. But I can think of very few kind of applications where you'd want that to happen in electronics. So these are actually, these two are being a little bit troublesome. Because there's a fair bit of copper hanging off them. So I've actually added some solder in to help them wick. So hopefully this will work. If not, I might have to go to the bigger tip. And it did work. Beautiful. And this one. go. See that's why it's called solder wick. Look at the way it's wicking. Just beautiful. There look at that. Gorgeous. The thing that kind of amazed me I guess in in the electronics business is how useful solder wick is even for surface mount work. You wouldn't think that it would be but it is absolutely. Okay so See if it will go through the holes this time. There we are. There. Hopefully, it should just drop in. Yeah, beautiful. Drop in it does. Just have to make sure it doesn't drop out when I turn it over. There, let's move this back a bit. Okay, just bend these over a little bit. That one, that way, and that one, that way. Start of the gate first because that's the one with the least. Oops, almost dropped it. There you go, there you are. Get it back up there. That's why I wanted to tack it. Sorry. Chucking around this side. That looks better. 
so I'll just trim these legs off. And just because the um, process of trimming the legs can just stress the joints a bit, I just like to again reflow them. after the fact. And I'll just give it a bit of a clean flux off the board. Okay, no matter. Alrighty. So, what this means is that theoretically, we have replaced, well, definitely, we've replaced the broken parts that we know about. So, um, I'm not going to dive in and do the smoke test on this just yet. Now that I've got those parts in, I just want to do some more poking around for me to do some DC resistance checks. Um, theoretically, both channels, if I've got it, both channels should test more or less the same in terms of DC resistance. So I can just do some sanity checks. I'm going to spend some time doing that. Um, I also need to clean up the chassis before this board can go back in because we've got our, our wasps, our mud hornets colony to clean up. Um, but Let's have a close look at this board first. Okay guys, some um, unfortunate but not surprising news. Um, so if you look carefully you'll notice that I've taken R265 off again to that 5.6 ohm resistor because when I did a resistance comparison between it and the one on the other channel I got very different results. So I just took the 5.6 ohms off um, so I can see better just what's going on and so basically when I look across there I get 22 ohms and this is on the output side um, so I think what this tells me unfortunately is that at least one of these final transistors is blown um, I probably should have found this out a lot sooner than now um, I guess I hadn't really been looking forward to the idea of having to pull them out because this heat sink arrangement is a real pain, the proverbial. And just with all the disruption and so on, the back and forth thing and uh, having COVID and so on hasn't helped in terms of good thought patterns. But anyway, the point is, is that every step I think has been a step forward rather than a step backwards. I haven't blown the thing up yet. Um, so, and again, it was just a bit of a nuisance just to work out exactly where to pick things up but I've now worked out that this is the common um, collector for all of these transistors is, is this point here so basically if I start looking across there I see 1.2 ohms across there I see 23 ohms um, if I compare that to the other channel um, I think it's this point here, we'll know in a second. Should I just double check by looking underneath? Yeah, it is. It's this point here. So if I look across there, I see about 12k and about 13k for all the transistors which one would expect. So coming back to this channel here, uh, if we go down here, yeah, 1.6 ohms, 23, 
that's just not right. Um, what is interesting though is if I look there I see 1.2 ohms, if I look there I see 1.6 ohms. So I'm seeing trace resistance. So that suggests that perhaps not all of the um, transistors have failed. 0.6 1.7, 1.6, 1 1.6, 1 there I read 1.2. So maybe I should start by pulling out that one first, which is the closest one, and um, see where we go. Let's see what the tester says. dead as a door now. So just um, shove that aside for a second. Just do a quick check just to see whether it's just that one. It looks like it is just that one. Three point six K a big. Yeah, and it looks like it is just that one because the um That short that I was seeing is now gone, or that low resistance. So, at the very least, I've got there's that one dead transistor anyway. Um, but I'm a little bit concerned about the thermal state of the thermal paste, so I may need to pull all the other ones out. Um, and if I'm going to have to pull them all out, I'm going to want to test them while they're out. So um, I'll put some thought to that as to what I'm going to do and uh, once I've made my mind up I'll take the next steps. Okay guys just a few things to show you so I've got one more of these transistors out just to test it. Current gain 37 which I think is probably okay. I'm going to pull the other two out of this quadrant. One of them was the dead one. Um, so this one, there's no insulation, there's no um, micro what pad there. Um, and the heat sink compound doesn't look too bad actually. So um, I'm just going to, I'm happy enough just to put this one straight back in. I might add just a little bit of compound, but um, it looks pretty good to me. I'm going to pull the other two transistors out just to check those. But, um, yeah, I just wasn't quite sure what was going on with it. One of them's got this thermal washer and the other one doesn't. Um, so it's quite clear when you look on the schematics. Um, turn that that way. So here they are down here. This is the dead one here, Q223. It's got those uh, funny little green insulating sleeves on the screws and then the wire running off to the board. So that comes up here, um, goes through these 2.4 ohm resistors in parallel to the output, whereas you'll see the other ones, they are all um, common collected. So, so they're, they're joined, their collectors are joined all up here. But the white, that one, Q223, which is the dead one, goes through these two resistors. So um, it's been a real pain <coughs> to um, multimeter these out because there's so much um, scunge on the actual metal. This is just where it's collected all the dust. So... Um, 
it's really, really hard to get a, a stable reading. And this is one of the things about um, you know high impedance input on a multimeter that you've got to keep in mind is that you know sometimes it'll it'll show you um, essentially what it looks like an open um, if you're not careful. But by the time you put a bit of power through it, um, it isn't open at all. So um, especially in high voltage, high power, high current situations, um, that can be an issue for determining whether something is actually um, connected together or not. So when we're looking at those two um, 0.4 ohm resistors in parallel, obviously that looks like 0.2 ohm, we're starting to talk about you know, lead lead resistance kind of values. So, um, yeah, just a little bit of a, a slight more of a complication, but yeah, now I've got a better idea what's going on here, I'm happy enough. So, um, I'm going to whack this transistor back in that I've taken out and tested, and I'm going to take the other two out, just check that those look like they're okay, and um, see where we go from there. Okay guys, so um, I had a pretty good poke around this thing and I'm fairly hopeful that we've found everything. Basically the, the manual says that if something fails in the output, you should really check all the way back to this op amp stage here um, to ensure that nothing else has failed and I think I've pretty much done that. I just checked this guy here and that is okay. Um, it also talks about checking the bias transistor. Now that's this guy here. Now it's not actually mounted on the PCB, it's mounted um, on the heatsink. So I had to go looking to find that and check that and it's okay. Um, and I'm pretty sure I've checked all the other ones uh, in the course of troubleshooting anyway. Um, there's another device mounted on the heatsink, which is this one down here, and it's used to work out the temperature of the heatsink. So um, that was interesting to note. Basically, it's a it's a current source, but um, it, it obviously changes as the temperature changes. So that's where I'm at. So basically. Yeah, hopefully she's hopefully she's looking pretty good. So I know that I do need to order one more transistor. Um, <coughs> couldn't find any stock here in Australia, um, and Mauser and Digikey don't have any stock. So Farnell have got stock, but no local stock. So it's going to be basically eight working days uh, for it to show up, which is kind of frustrating. Um, because I really do want to get this thing off the bench. And it just, you know, every time you've got to wait for something to come in, it just drags in. But um, this is a hobby, so um, I can't afford to have huge amounts of parts reserves here. And I just need to get things in as I need them. So um, I will order that transistor. Um, the other thing that I'll do, and I won't bore you by doing it on camera, is I'll clean up the bottom chassis, get rid of the, the, mud, the uh, mud from the wasps, um, so that hopefully when this board has got its new transistor in, it can go back in the chassis and we can do some more testing on it. Okay, so I've got my new transistor has arrived from Mauser, so I'll just run it through the tester. Yep, unsurprisingly, it tests okay. So, its gain is a little bit higher than the other three that I tested, but I think that's okay. I'm certainly not going to replace anything more than I have to, because I need to get this thing out of here, and it just isn't worth spending any more money on it. But, there it is. MJ21194G Mexico. So I'm going to put in a nice new um, insulating washer. That one's probably okay, but we'll put in a new one anyway. So we'll put some 
thermal compound on this side. Drop that one on there. I'll whack some on this side as well. Okay. Right, so now we need to get this transistor where it belongs. Well, that was nice, it almost fell into place. I think it did fall into place. Now, so we've got these little, these are mounting screws, they've got these little insulating sleeves so we need to make sure we don't lose those The other one is what connects this lug so I'm just going to clean this thermal paste off this side that's not meant to be there just drops in there I believe yeah that's how it was the green bit through the center Okay, there we go. Right, so I'm just testing with a multimeter now. So basically, 
that's the heatsink. So the screws themselves are obviously connected to the heatsink, but the case is not connected to the heatsink, which is correct. But then through a little doodad, this spade terminal is connected to the case. Okay, so that is correct. So now we just have to solder these two pins on this transistor and when we've done that it is installed. Two. So there we are. Remember this is where we started out having these blown parts. Hopefully we've got them now. So I'll just do one last sanity check over this board. And then all being well, it can go back in the enclosure. Okay, smoke test time guys. I am going to run it through my Dimbold tester. Um, because that way, if there is something catastrophic, then the DBT will catch it. So let's just first of all try this which is what should happen because this is turned off. Now turn this on. Now this. Okay, that doesn't seem quite right, does it? Suggests that it, it's trying to do something But it is an improvement on where it was, that's for sure. Actually, I've decided that that may not be a fault. Well, I hope it's not a fault. So I've taken the Dimbold tester out. Um, because if, if it's trying to start, it hasn't got enough power through the Dimbold tester, it could be causing it to go through that cycling condition that we're seeing. So I've taken the Dimbold tester out. Now we'll see what happens. Okay. Okay guys, so obviously this is a not a good sign that I've got the board out again. Um, the reason being that this thing is fundamentally unserviceable and that is part of the reason why I'm afraid to say that we've reached the end of the road. I'm going to have to admit defeat on this thing. Um, it is unserviceable in that most of the components are on the bottom side so obviously you can't operate it like this unless you've got Crown's um, a harness extension kit which I'm not really a big fan of anyway, having it hanging out on extension leads to make it go. But it's just because there's no bottom panel, um, which I think is really, really poor design. I mean, you know, they've saved some money by just designing the enclosure so that there's no bottom panel, but it makes the thing fundamentally unserviceable. So, um, and because so many of the components are surface mount, you, you can't pick up on the top side anything that you need to measure. So 
Um, in our last step we saw that it obviously still wasn't working and it was a real nightmare just to try to find anything sensible to just even to be able to pick up. Um, so obviously the thing I wanted to check was supply voltages. It certainly wasn't going to have supply voltages in the state that it came to me because it had all those um, dead components um, in the power stages so those needed to be um, dealt with to have any hope of having um, supply rails but um, now that those have been dealt with still not working so anyway I've managed to verify um, that I was not getting plus or minus 15 volts and poking around a little bit more um, I found some some vias here these are the plus or minus 15 volt regulators and I found some vias nearby them that I could get onto from this side and I was able to find minus 15 but I couldn't find plus 15 um, I think this little via here if I'm correct it should be I think that should be plus 15 but um, there's these op amps over here and I wasn't finding any voltages on these op amps over here there should be plus or minus 15 supply on these op amps one two three four of them and there was no supply voltage there so um, I pulled it out to have a, a closer look because it's just really hard to see anything while it's in the enclosure and um, you're going to see something now that um, would have been a whole lot easier for me to see if I had a microscope and I still aren't, can't actually see this even under the Maggie lamp I get better magnification with a camera than I get with a Maggie lamp but if we just come in here and if I just zoom in focus right so it's pretty clear there that the track is missing now with a naked eye I mentioned to you before at the at the very start that this thing had quite a bit of corrosion and to the naked eye it just looks like a, a track with a bit of corrosion on it now when I um, feel it if I feel it like this I can actually quite clearly feel doing that that there's no track there but I can't see with certainly can't see with the naked eye and I can't even see with the Maggie lamp, I don't have enough magnification on the Maggie lamp to actually see that that track has gone. It's quite clear on the camera. Um, so this is yet another example of why I really need a microscope um, to be able to, to see these kinds of things and also for you know this kind of surface mount work. So what it basically looks like is, is that this thing has had the proverbial blown out of it. Let's zoom out again this thing has had the proverbial blown out of it is what it comes down to could it be repaired well theoretically yes if I replaced all the dead components and um, fixed the open circuit tracks then yes it, it should work but I've already spent probably more money on this thing that's actually worth there's nothing special about it this was just meant to be a, a technical exercise and um, it's it's just got to the point now where it's clear that this thing has is seriously ill. Um, it does appear that it has it has had the proverbial blown out of it. Even if I were to repair these tracks, um, these op amps are probably dead as well. Probably numerous other things that are dead as well. The fact that I'm still not 100% sure which is the correct schematic because it's really hard to work that out from the service manual and also that the scans in the service manual are really poor as well. So um, I'm not convinced that I actually have a proper technical reference as to what this is supposed to be anyway. So it, it really is at the point now where I think it would be foolish to continue. But anyway, I am going to put the video, video up because a lot of what this channel is about is learning and it's, it's learning for me as well. Um, hopefully we can learn together, hopefully this is, this is useful for you um, and that's, that's part of the reason why I do this channel. 
not everything's going to be a success. The, the purpose of this channel is not to, to show, you know, how wonderful I am at fixing things, because that's, that, that's not what it's for. It's, it's for us to share learnings together, and I hope that you have learned something with this. So, um, thank you so much if you stayed to the end with me. I hope you did get something out of it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and let's hope that we have better luck on the next repair video, and I look forward to seeing you there. Bye for now.